Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Good evening. From 1931 till uh, 2009, HCJB was one of the most listened to shortwave stations in the world. And from a sprawling compound in central Ecuador, they broadcast in uh, dozens of languages uh, using huge antennas and powerful transmitters. And uh, much of the uh, transmitters and antennas they designed and built themselves. And 20 years ago, I wanted to take a vacation where I did something uh, more significant than sitting by the water pampering myself. So I applied to HCJB and they offered me a job as a working visitor. And my wife and I went there for a month and I got to travel and serve others and play with radio. So you can't really beat a combination like that. From the middle of the world in Quito, Ecuador, this is HCJB World Radio, the voice of the Andes. We continue to North America on 9,745 and 11,840 kilohertz, as well as on the web at hcjb.org. At the final tone, it will be 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's the same as 0330 hours GBC. So here's a map of Ecuador. The Andes Mountains run down through the middle of the country. And to the east, it's hot and wet and the beginning of the Amazon River. And to the west is hot and dry. And the middle part is uh, kind of ideal uh, spring-like weather year round. And uh, there's dozens of uh, volcanoes, some of them, uh, one of them over 20,000 feet and several over 15,000 feet. Quito is where the studios are and offices for HCJB, but the transmitters were out about 20 miles east of there um, in the mountains. And then they have a power plant that's another 20 miles east of there. Um, Quito is um, the capital. It's at 9,300 feet ele elevation. So it's one of the highest capital cities in the world. And the, the air is thin. You could really use an extra lung. Um, and it's 12 miles south of the equator, but because of the elevation, the weather's ideal. It's about 75 every day and 55 at night uh, year round. And even though it's on the west uh, side of South America, it's Quito's due south of Buffalo, New York. Let's see, so this is uh, in the old part of um, the south part of the city. And now we're out in PIFO. This is 20 miles to the east and that's where the, the transmitters are. It's a more rural area, so they've got room for all the uh, antennas out here. And this was the, the town we lived in. We lived with a missionary couple uh, in this town, and uh, he was kind of the head engineer for um, all the transmitters. And in Ecuador, uh, food is good and it's real bargain. I, I don't know if you want to eat the fish. Uh, it's sitting out there in the sun all day, uh, but it was uh, uh, three pounds for a dollar of fish, or you could get pineapple or six pineapples for a dollar. Uh, notice the speaker here on his truck. That's so in the morning he could drive around and uh, advertise. And this is the streets in Pifo. You can see Mount Cotopaxi in the background. That's the world's highest active volcano. And it's nearly 20,000 feet high. And in the afternoon, you don't see the volcano. It's It doesn't look like it's hidden. It just looks like there's nothing there. The, the sun heats the glacier up and the volcano makes its own cloud uh, that's, that hides it. And it, you know, it doesn't look like it's cloudy. It just looks like there's a uh, sky there, but you, know, you just don't see it. It's, it's kind of interesting. And I rode my bike uh, about two miles every day uh, up the street to work. And the people are all very friendly. Everybody's going, uh, buenos dias. Uh, and they, a lot of them seem to know who I was or why I was there, which is kind of surprised me. This is the uh, main transmitter building. Um, and you can see there's a dish antenna right here that receives the programming from Quito uh, 20 miles away on a, using a six gigahertz uh, radio made by um, Collins. Um, there was, this uh, transfer building was run by four missionaries, three from the US and one from New Zealand. And there were also um, about 30 um, Ecuadorians that were employed there. They get paid, uh, starting pay was about $180 a month, which was good by Ecuador standards. And the missionaries don't get a salary since they, they raise their own support. And every morning when I'd get here, I'd had to make it a 
a point to go around and greet everybody uh, before I start to do any work. In Ecuador, it's all about relationships, and that's a lot more important than getting the job done or being on time. Um, and one of the sayings I heard was that the North, North Americans have the watches, but they have the time. Um, and the people are all very friendly and industrious, and they can fix anything, and they do. They keep their vehicles running you know, way past when we would have uh, gotten rid of them. There's another saying in Ecuador that uh, heads are not just for hats. And the, the the indigenous culture there, they're very um, hardworking, both the men and women. They're not, it's not like a Latin laid back culture like uh, some might expect. Um, this is inside the transmitter building. You can see four of the HC100s. That's a 100 kilowatt transmitter. Those were designed by volunteers at their office in Elkar, Indiana. And um, it's a pretty high performance 100 kilowatt uh, transmitter. There's some of the specs of the transmitter. It automatically tunes from five to 22 megahertz. The output is 300 ohm balance and that's the case for uh, all of their transmitters. And one thing really unique is they have this clever modulator that dissipates about a 10th of what uh, traditional uh, analog to uh, modulator stage would draw. And this modulator's got 64 300 volt power supplies. And then there's a, each of them have a FET and the FET can either make that power supply be in series with the others or just be bypassed. So that all of those um, supplies add up and give them a, a 14,000 volt audio waveform. And, uh, and then the, the tube lineup, there's a 4CX 3500 that drives a 4CV 100,000. So that's a tube. The dissipation is rated for is 100,000 watts, and the V in the in the part number that means it's vapor phase cooled. There's water comes in to the tube, and uh, water vapor goes out of that, and then that gets condensed in a big radiator out back and and changed back into water. It takes 220 kilowatts to uh, at full power, 100% modulation. There's, you can see a few of these modules and these, each of these are a 300 volt power supply and there's a little cable like here, here's one right here. You can see my uh, cursor and another one here. And those are fiber cables and the fiber enables this module or bypasses it. And so that um, that gives them a you know, really high efficiency uh, audio waveform. And the other thing that's clever about it is now, if you turned one of these on, you'd have 300 volts. If you turned two of them on, you'd have 600. Three, you'd have 900. But they don't just turn one and then the next and the next. Um, the control board for this uh, turns the modules on in, in a pseudo-random pattern so that the power is equally distributed among all of them. Uh, you know, So for 300 volts, one of them would turn on. For 600, it'd be two other ones and so on. So it's done in a random way. Uh, and this is the transformer that provides the, you know, the kind of the primary side of all those modules. It, it's got all these windings, you know, 64 windings to give you 300 volts that, that powers those. And this is the output compartment. The, the final tube is in there somewhere in the middle. And um, over here on the left side, this is a parallel plate capacitor. Um, that's for sensing what the RF voltage is uh, on the tube. And there's water coming into the tube and, and vapor going out of it. This compartment also has uh, an RF arc detection and a visual um, arc detection circuit in there. So if there's any arcing for any reason, uh, the thing can shut down. There's meters for you know grid current, screen current, plate current, SWR, all those kind of things uh, that you'd expect. And then there's two meters, uh, one over here on the left, one on the right, that you could program to look at any other things that you might want to look at. And then on top of that, um, there's a PC built into the transmitter, and it keeps track of, of everything. And if you wanted to look at, for example, let's say you wanted to know what's the peak screen grid current of the driver tube since the last time I looked. I mean, you could you could check that. All kinds of stuff like that is uh, is recorded. And it also monitors the air and the water temperature. Um, so you can see well, what the water temperature is going into the, um, like the plate tank coil has water going through the middle of it. Uh, 
the, to cool it. And you could see what's the water temperature going in and the water coming out. From that, you could tell the efficiency and tell that everything's working properly. This is the 500 kilowatt. They have one 500 kilowatt transmitter. It's one of a handful of uh, transmitters that big in the world. And it was also designed and built in Elkhart. And it takes a lot of electricity to run a transmitter like that. But since HGJP built their own uh, dam and power plant, um, they could afford to do it. Um, at my regular job in uh, Rochester, you know, I had to use tweezers and a microscope to work on the radios that we built. So it was really nice here where I could work on a transmitter with a crescent wrench. And they did get to work on it. Um, in the uh, On the left side here is a vacuum variable capacitor. This is rated at 45,000 volts and 800 amps. And it failed one afternoon while I was there. And so I got to troubleshoot it and figure out what was going on. And um, this, this 10 inch pipe right here is actually a coax. It's 150 ohm coax, uh, which is part of the ballon. And this back wall in the transfer, that whole wall moves. Um, right now that wall is kind of close to us because it's the transfer is tuned to 21.5 megahertz. But if we went to a lower frequency, that whole wall would move back away from here and these uh, copper fingers uh, make contact with it. It's the construction techniques are what we normally just see in a VHF or UHF transmitter, but you know, because of the power, um, this thing's built um, kind of like what you would expect in, in microwave stuff, but even though it's at HF. So these are a couple of the um, missionary volunteers, uh, Scott on the left and Tim. Tim is HC1, HLO, and Scott's a W9, I don't remember his call. And I used to work, Tim, sometimes on 40 meters in the mornings from uh, here on using uh, PSK, what was it, PSK? It's been so long, 32 or 31. Uh, anyway, we worked each other sometimes on 40 meters at like seven in the morning. And the, these are, modulator tubes have um, hoses going out of the top because uh, they're water cooled and there's 34,000 volts on them. So um, the water has to be highly distilled and, and they frequently check that. There's kind of the tube lineup, a pair of 4CX 350s, drive a 4CV 35,000, which drives this 4CV. 500,000. And then there's a tuning network that's all uh, computer controlled. And this is the power supply for that transmitter. And I'm inside the power supply. Um, I'm standing next to the uh, plate choke. Or not plate choke, but the filter, the filter choke in the, the power supply. And then there's some of the bleeder resistors. If you turn around and look the other way, you can see some more bleeder resistors and the filter caps. And um, up high on the wall there are the, um, those six uh, modules are the bridge rectifiers for the three phase AC that comes in. And that transfer was dedicated to uh, Clarence Moore. Clarence was uh, W9, Lima Zulu X-ray. He was the chief engineer in the late 30s. He invented the cubicle quad, and that was to solve problems they were having with coronas burning away the ends of Yagi antennas. Because of the high power and the high elevation, uh, they'd get corona on the antennas. And he tried putting six inch copper balls from sewage flush tanks on them, but uh, he's, they still had some trouble. So in the summer of 42, he had the idea of a loop antenna with no ends on it, and the quad was born. And he patented that uh, antenna, and he described it as a pulled open folded dipole. And he eventually came back to Elkhart, Indiana, and he started Crown Electronics, which is a manufacturer of high-performance audio equipment. And he set aside part of his uh, building space uh, so HCJB volunteers could build gear there. And that operation is still going today. This is one of their um, newer transmitters. This thing is, is made in uh, Elkhart. It's a thousand watt AM uh, shortwave transmitter and a thousand watt AM is 4,000 watts PEP. So it's, it's a lot of power and it's a complete radio station that can be just you know deployed in the jungle of South America or the deserts of Africa, you know, fit in a suitcase. And uh, down here at the bottom is the web 
address for that operation in uh, Elkhart, if anybody was interested. Another thing ACJB did was they bought these little radios from a company in Israel for $20 a piece. And they gave them away to people in remote villages. They're fixed tuned to an ACJB frequency and they're designed to be very durable. The only control on it is um, a three position switch for off, soft, or loud. And there's a swimming pool and you could swim in it if you wished. Uh, it's kept warm by water from some of their older transmitters. In the attic of the transmitter building, um, they had uh, this antenna switch. This thing was a, a mechanical uh, marvel. The ductwork is actually 300 ohm uh, balanced feed line. And each of their 12 transmitters uh, follow a path that runs from front to back underneath here. So we've got these ducts going left to right. Each of these are hooked to an antenna. You can see some um, threaded rods sticking through the walls. On the other side of those are um, glass bowl insulators that go out you know, with, with open wire line to uh, different antennas. So the antennas run from left to right and the transmitters are underneath here running through similar ducts that are going from front to back. And these servo motors um, can move to connect uh, any of the 12 transmitters to um, any of the 35 antennas. And they're kind of the main antenna is a curtain array. Um, we're looking at the curtain array for North America. It's a little hard to see, but there's a, a, a wire mesh that goes between this tower and the tower to the left of there. A whole bunch of fine wires you could see. And then out in front of it, here is a folded dipole. And this folded dipole is up 100 feet. And up above is another folded dipole up 200 feet. And there's 300 ohm uh, feed open wire line uh, the line comes from the bottom, it comes up and out, and then to each of these folded dipoles. And to the left of this, there's two more folded dipoles. I got a sketch that uh, shows that maybe a little more clear. So um, the signal comes from the transmitter and it goes to uh, these the two dipoles on the right or the two on the left. And, um, and there's a screen behind them. And then on the other side of the screen, it's, it's an identical, uh, another set of antennas that point towards South America. These are pointing towards North America. This phase shifting house can make it so the uh, the dipoles on the right and left are fed in phase or fed slightly out of phase. And that way they can steer the beam to the East Coast of North America or the West Coast. And to do that phase shifting, uh, there's a, a big contactor relay in this uh, doghouse. So the feed line comes in from the left and it either goes straight through and then on out to the uh, other antenna or it's switched so it goes through up and over the house and back down. And that extra length of feed line um, causes a phase shift to steer the uh, antenna. And on their compound, there's 45 towers. Some are over 400 feet high and the towers are all fabricated in the machine shop right there on the grounds. Um, there's also a complete auto shop and a wood shop. And this mountain in the background is Mount Pachincha. It's a, a volcano. It's around, I think it's between 12 and 14,000 feet high. Um, and a friend of ours lives about uh, a mile from there. And she woke up one morning in October of 99 when it was erupting and she uh, took this picture, which she gave me. And it was just getting started then, but it, it ended up um, covering all the land around there with a couple inches of ash. The most interesting antenna um, is what they call the steerable dish. It's, it's kind of like a parabolic dish, except um, this shape is not a parabola. It's, a, it's a, like a quarter of a sphere. Uh, on a parabola, you would have slightly more gain, but a parabola focuses only in one spot. And where a sphere, you could move your feed point around and you could, you could could it'll point in different directions. So there's a 450 foot tower in the middle. Um, and then there's six 200 foot towers around it. 
uh, and they strung out between that is this mesh that's in a, a giant quarter of a sphere. And down here in front of it is a folded dipole that's on a track so it can move so they can point the antenna. This has um, 24 dB of gain at 21 megahertz. It was designed by a, a broadcast engineer named Carl Smith who lived in uh, Cleveland. And this is the feed for that. It looks like a giant egg beater and it's fed with 300 wire open wire uh, feed line that pivots on the tower behind it. So you could see the feed point uh, right here where my uh, cursor is and it comes from this tower. That tower is uh, 450 feet tall and the feed comes out to this uh, big egg beater. And you can see here the track that's riding on. And to move that on the track, um, there's a pump house. It's got a hydraulic pump and hydraulic motor and it this big drum uh, rotates and there's a cable about an inch in diameter uh, that goes out to the um, that egg beater antenna and uh, and by this thing rotating it, it drags that back and forth. Um, this is all controlled automatically um, from inside the transmitter building. There's a computer that controls all the uh, frequencies, antennas, does all that switching, points this where it needs to, depending on the, the broadcast schedule. And that, that antenna is aimed pretty much north, so and they can steer over a 110 degree arc. So they're able to cover from Europe over to Japan. Here's a shot from the air of the, the facility. And the, this antenna in the foreground is the, um, it's the curtain antenna for the Americas. Then back behind, there's pairs of towers uh, back here. Those are curtain antennas for uh, Asia and Europe. And there's a new airport in Quito. Uh, the airport used to be right um, next to the city and the city grew around it and they needed to move the airport. Well, they moved it out near here. And so all these towers um, had to be taken down. In, uh, and in 2009, um, pretty much all of the operation ended up getting shut down. A lot of it got moved to Australia. So HCJB is still broadcasting from the north tip of Australia. They broadcast to uh, India and China and all the thousands of islands in the um, South Pacific. Um, but um, they still broadcast from here on three and six megahertz um, using um, Nivis or near vertical, they, you know, where they, on three and six megahertz, they beam the signals uh, straight up. They have a thing called a lazy H antenna that aims the signal straight up and comes back down and they, they can broadcast to the indigenous people in Peru and Ecuador. And they still have uh, an FM station but the other shortwave stuff is um, gone. And back behind, you can't really see it here, but that uh, spherical dish is back here in the background. There's also a rhombic that's pointed at Europe. And this plateau is one of the few flat spaces in um, the Andes. So that's the reason why it was chosen. This is the control room and they have several channels of programming that come in different languages from Keto over the microwave link. And the software routes the programming to the appropriate transmitter, depending on the broadcast schedule. Uh, it commands the uh, transmitters to the right frequency and switches each of the 12 transmitters to one of the 35 antennas. And it points that steerable antenna in the right direction. And there's an operator here 24-7. Uh, so he can override um, the operation if he needs to. And uh, the government made HCJB the official timekeeper for the country of Ecuador. And that's, I think, partly why you hear uh, them say, you know, at the, at the final tone, it will be 2,300 hours UTC, that sort of thing, because um, they're the official timekeeper for the country. They used to run everything on uh, diesel generators. They got four big diesel generators, but um, they uh, built a dam and a power plant. And while I was there, um, 
they were building a second, they built a second dam and they're working on the power plant for that um, so they could make their own electricity. And these are gauges where they could monitor the power being uh, generated by the power plant and how much was coming in. And so now we're on our way up to where the uh, power plant is and we're going up over the um, continental divide. Even though we're only about 150 miles from the Pacific and we're probably at least a couple thousand miles from the Atlantic, uh, the continental divide is here. And we're up about 14,000 feet. This is the village of, of Papayakta. And uh, in Papayakta, some of the houses have hot running water, which they can get from the uh, geothermal springs that are there. And there's uh, um, swimming places that you can go to. It's pretty nice. And to get there, we had to go over this bridge every time. And uh, in Ecuador, you have to be careful uh, where you step and how you drive. Uh, the traffic lights are merely a suggestion and the WL line on the road is just a waste of paint. Here's the power plant, and uh, they could generate six megawatts of electricity here. Um, and the extra electricity they would sell um, to the electric company. Um, ACJB never asked their audience for money because they felt that would detract from their mission. And instead, they finance, they were financed by churches and individuals. and. Um, and they made some money by selling the excess electricity. Um, after I'd been there a couple of weeks, I thought I gotta find a reason to come back with my friends. And, and we did, I went back there about uh, 11 or 12 more times um, with groups of uh, people, mostly from our church to help them build some classrooms and things like that. Um, and when we came back, we stayed in this house up here every time. It was a really nice house. It was built by HCJB to house uh, volunteer teams that come down. One thing interesting is there's a fireplace there. It's really hard to get a fire going in the fireplace because of the altitude. There's less air and people there put gasoline, they actually use gasoline to start fires in their house. Um, and it's not as explosive because of the uh, less air. I didn't try it, but uh, that's what I hear. Um, here's the, uh, the two megawatt generator. This was... Uh, a generator made in 1911, and they salvaged this from an electric utility in Seattle. And water from the Penstock, uh, there's a dam like 800 feet higher than this, and that water comes down and it spins a turbine uh, here in, behind me. And then uh, right behind me is the generator itself, and then there's a flywheel inside this, uh, this circle here on the left. They have a PLC, which is a programmable logic controller, and it figures out um, whether to run one generator or the other generator or both and at what capacity. They always want to make enough electricity to power all the transmitters, and they'd like to make a little extra electricity to sell, but they don't want to you know, sell too much and run out of water. So, And the two generators have different capacities and different efficiencies, and this PLC does all the math to figure out the optimum configuration and makes it happen. The, the voltage coming out of the generators is 2,900 volts and they step it up to 45,000 in these transformers to for the 20 mile trip back to the transmitters. And the, the poles for that are all made out of, uh, they, they made themselves out of rebar and cement. This is the where they're putting the pen stock in for the new power plant. Um, and there's a 28 inch pipe that's going to carry water from the dam uh, down to the power plant that's in the distance uh, below. The, the big vertical drop lets them generate more electricity with less water. And that's important because there's not much rain during the dry season. And the generator takes over a cubic meter of water per second. And this water gets used three times. It go, it's going to go through this power plant and then the other power plant that we saw before is downstream from here. And then it continues on and becomes drinking water in keto. Although it's not safe to drink. Um, and speaking of water, here's how they get water uh, through a valley. Um, 
the water comes out of this uh, other side of the hill. Where we're standing is about, is a couple of feet lower than the other side of the hill. And the water comes out uh, and just with gravity goes all the way down. And then because of the pressure all the way back up and, and fills this cistern that's right behind us. And uh, there's, I can't remember how many hundred steps. There's a lot of steps right next to this pipe which you can walk down and back up if you want to. And we did, it was pretty unnerving because there's no railing. Um, another thing that ACJB does is helps uh, local churches. And this is a church that's being built. It's, it's far from being done, but the roof's up. So they're already having services in there. And this is Mount Antasana, which is uh, 19,000 feet tall. And it also makes its own cloud. and you can see how clear it looks here, but there'll be uh, most days you don't even see it at all. And it doesn't look like there's a cloud in the way. It just looks like there's nothing there. We stopped at this, at the Continental Divide, we stopped at this little uh, diner and got coffee and empanadas. And I took a, this picture. And when I took the picture, the woman got all excited. I thought she was offended that I had taken her picture, but turns out she just wanted me to get a picture of her grandson too. So she grabbed a trout. They have trout farms there. It's the ideal weather for trout because it's always cold, but never freezing. And she grabbed a trout out of this uh, dish pan on the floor and it slipped out of her hands a couple of times. And then she hung it on her grandson's finger and had me get the picture and then put it back in there. And it'll be somebody's dinner tonight. And while I was playing radio, uh, my wife uh, played with kids. Uh, this was a kids club. It was an after school get together sponsored by the church. Um, a woman and her three kids lived in this one bedroom house, um, had no indoor plumbing, no refrigerator. The walls were decorated with feed sacks or pages torn from uh, magazines and had a bench uh, from a truck uh, to use as a couch and light bulbs hanging from extension cords. But Anyway, we stayed in touch with uh, this family um, and we're still in touch with them. And the, the woman there um, got remarried and had another uh, daughter, which she named Shirley, my wife's name. So that was um, quite a, a surprise. When we were there in 2001, there was no phone, no internet. We were pretty much cut off from the rest of the world. And now everybody there has got a cell phone. They're on Facebook. They're um, sending me uh, pictures of their uh videos of their kids saying happy birthday to me and things like that. It's uh, quite a change. This is, we got up at six every morning. I rode my bike uh, to the transmitter compound and Shirley walked up here uh, to this daycare at, at the church. And then later she'd walk back to a school and work there. And she only knew three Spanish words, please, thank you, and bathroom. <laughs> but uh, they got along and had a great time together. And this is at the school where she also worked. And it's, you know, they have public education, but the parents still have to pay for uniforms and books and meals. And now this morning we're headed up to Mount Atacazo. That's another volcano south of Quito. HCJB has a repeater there so they can relay their programming to an FM station out on the coast, about 150 miles away. And this is up on top, and uh, the signals come in here on 942 megahertz and go back out on 222 megahertz. It's using some uh, studio to transmitter link equipment made by Mosley, and, uh, and they had an 80 watt Mirage amp on the 220 uh, radio and a pair of homemade Yaggies. And now it's another morning. We're going to go up on top of Mount Pachincha where HCJB had their AM transmitter. This is up at the top. And it was a common sight to see uh, fires on the hillside. I'm not sure how much of it was it was intentional and how much it was from uh, lightning. Um, another familiar site on hillsides were rose farms. They'd be lit up all night. So the roses would grow 24-7. Uh, That's one of their big exports. And we bought roses. You could buy them. At that time, you could buy 25 long stem roses for $1.70. The, they've got a 100 kilowatt uh, transmitter that was built by Harrison and donated to them in exchange for the patent rights to that modulator I told you about. 
And there's 80 modules. Each module has a winding that goes through a toroid and then a big copper pipe going through them. So that's how all these different modules would all add to the current in this copper pipe. And the, each of the modules had four FETs in them and those FETs would get uh, toggled on and off at, at a 690 kilohertz, which is the frequency they were on. And, and they would modulate the transmitter by controlling you know, how many of the modules are toggling at 690 kilohertz and how many of them are just sitting there idle. And for coax, um, it's the coax is these wires. There's two wires in the middle and four wires um, on the side. So you can see two wires in the middle here and and four around them. And that's their coax. It's, it's low cost and uh, it can handle a lot of power. And the only problem is when uh, lightning uh, melts a wire, um, which is what happened here. And uh, Tim and I are fixing uh, one of the coax wires that got melted from uh, lightning. And that happened even though they got a lightning arrestor. This is their lightning arrestor on the top of the hill. The main studios for HCJB, it's kind of like this oasis in the middle of the city. It's a whole city block with really nice buildings. Uh, this building we're looking at is the HR department. Behind that's the music department. They have a photography department. They have a, a three-year college, uh, uh, the Center for Christian Communications and, um, and studios in all different languages, a print shop, an engineering building. Um, here's one of the um, announcers. This is Rachel Orr. She was a missionary from Ireland and she had a program called Studio Nine that you were likely to hear if you tuned in. And then there were other interesting programs like DX Party Line and Ham Radio Today. And they had a program called Spotlight, which they broadcast in, in special English. That's a limited vocabulary, like 1500 words. And it's spoken slowly to help people who are trying to learn English. And they every two months they had a new QSL card with, and they had a different theme every year. These are cards collected by uh, AWA's Brad Mitchell in AYG. You can see here, July, 1973. Um, this 10 meter dish um, was built by um, HCJB um, employees and, and volunteers uh, right there at the transmitter compound. It's a 10 meter diameter uh, dish and it picks up programs that are being broadcast. Are, their intended audience is North America, but by having this huge dish, they can pick up those programs in um, being down in Ecuador. This is the engineering building behind us. And here's how this all got started. In uh, 1931, a guy named Clarence Jones and uh, Ruben Larson and their wives um, left the comfort of the States and they came to Quito. Their dream was to spread the gospel using something new, radio. You know, they, um, you know, what, with radio, they could tell thousands of people about Jesus without, you know, having to traipse through the jungles. And, uh, you know, even though radio had spread rapidly in the States during the 20s, in 1931, there was still uh, no broadcast station in Ecuador and there was only a handful of receivers. And they convinced the Ecuador government uh, and they gave Clarence permission to operate a station. Um, the government saw that as a way to kind of jumpstart them uh, into radio. Uh, and so on Christmas day, 1931, from this makeshift uh, converted sheep shed, they went on the air with uh, 200 watts. And then over the years, the transmitters and the antennas grew and then they branched out into education and healthcare. HCJV runs two hospitals in the, uh, Ecuador also, and TV program production where they would take TV programs and dub them into Spanish. And then in 2009, the new airport required them to take down the towers. And so, and also there were technology and cultural changes that replaced shortwave with internet and local FM broadcasting. So some of that now is being done in Australia, but you know, some of it's just gone. So I was happy I got to be there. Um, it was still going. This is a market we visited in uh, Otavalo. 
Um, we saw tire shops uh, everywhere. And I, I asked somebody, I said, I mean, why is there so many tire shops? Do you have a lot of flats? And he goes, no, not really. Well, in the month we were there, we had two flats, um, but there were shops everywhere and it only cost us 80 cents to have it fixed. And Ecuador is the Spanish word for equator. And uh, we're standing right on it. We're, Shirley and I are in di different hemispheres. So that's the end of our trip. We've just taken off. We're flying uh, back home. Uh, but Ecuador was a, a great place. The people were great. They were very friendly. Some of them were crying when we left. The kids were wonderful. The weather was perfect. The uh, mountains were beautiful. And HDJB was really impressive and professional and first class. And uh, I knew uh, I needed to go back there, uh, which which we did about a dozen times um, after that. And those were all good trips trips too. So, um, and there's so many stories to tell. I mean, it's hard to uh, squeeze it all into 45 minutes or so, but um, there were, there were a lot of um, good experiences and, and sad experiences. And, you know, some days it would be like a roller coaster, just the uh, um, range of emotions and things, but uh, it was a, a pretty neat place. And uh, we never had any trouble or felt threatened or anything there. And, uh, the uh, the technology and stuff they had was uh, was really impressive to you know all the stuff that they created themselves. This is the Voice of the Andes, HCJB, Quito, Ecuador, broadcasting in the English language to Europe in 16 and 19 meters. The time now, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1900 Greenwich Mean Time. <laughs>